Can I now turn to our third speaker, our third guest lecturer, Professor Learson, Professor of Modern European Languages at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's the chair of Modern European Literatures in that university, former director of the Husinga Institute, the Dutch Research Institute for Cultural History, very widely published on national stereotyping and the history of nationalism and cultural encounters in Europe, and a recipient, a recipient excuse me, of the Spinoza Prize and a member of the Royal Irish Academy, Professor Learson. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in Jurassic Park, dinosaurs are brought back from extinction, and there's a maverick scientist who's furiously ha tapping on his laptop and understands something arcane called chaos theory or cha um, complex, and he says, those dinosaurs will all escape and eat us all. That's a bit my role, uh, because uh, I'm leaving you to ponder who the dinosaurs are. Uh, but um, uh, I'm going to spend 19 out of the 20 minutes talking about gloom and doom before I spend the remaining minute trying to identify a possible way out. And also because I'm, I have a very, as my grasp of real you know, chaos theory is about as tenuous as that of Steven Spielberg or Michael Crichton. So I'm, I'm really venturing way outside. Um, and uh, chaos is already striking in that I cannot see my PowerPoint. Uh, right, can, I, can that uh, login screen be clicked away there? Um, I want to begin by saying that my, my title is uh, Matthew Arnold in a Risk Society, uh, or the hyphen, the slash, and the need for knowledge plus. And I want to um, begin by saying that this is a very, very good time to be a cultural historian. So to invoke another Victorian, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I'll be giving you a bit of the best and a lot of the worst. The spirit of inquiry is flourishing and it's thrilling and new intellectual horizons are opening up. In my own field, intellectual history, things are being shaken up by the activities of a bright new cohort of researchers that's entering into our field from Central and Eastern European universities of the post-1989 paradigm, um, and some of the most heartening and inspiring experiences I've had in Tarnovo, Bucharest, Sofia, by way of Novi Sad, Prague, Budapest, all the way up to Tartu and Tallinn, and it's really, really thrilling to see what's germinating from that end of the new Europe. And intellectually, there are exciting new working models, such indeed as complexity studies, which is where our risk society comes from and where chaos theory comes from and the study of self-organization and change in complex systems, things that used to be called tipping points and are, are known as cascading events, where in seemingly random situations through no obvious single cause, uh, chaos either emerges or order emerges, as the case may be. Um, we might see the sudden rise of romanticism in Europe, or last night when we had that marvelous um, uh, concert that was referred to, that people started applauding, and applause is a typical chaotic system, and then suddenly there is a pattern of rhythmic applause emerging from that chaos. Um, and uh, we can uh, see the uh, other tipping points, like the sudden abrupt secularization of Ireland in the last 30 years, the sudden failure of electrical grids, what's going on neurologically in the brain during an epileptic attack, uh, the crisis of the university, the best of times, the worst of times. These are cascading events in complex systems, and it is as such that I would like to address creativity and innovation in the university. So to understand the university in the, at the present day, we need chaos theory. I think there's already a moral there. Um, chaos theory arose together with the social uh, advent of what is variously known as the risk society, or a second modernity, or a liquid modernity. Um, and uh, it is in that situation that I would like to uh, offer a few thoughts on um, the uh, situation of research, uh, the research environment and the university system. And I take from my cue a discussion I had with Honora O'Neill on the topic of the two cultures. Because I'm spreading, I'm, I'm going from cultural history into chaos theory, I realize I had to underpin this a little bit. Uh, C.P. Snow's famous lecture and essay from 1959, which in the tradition of Giambattista Vico, Matthew Arnold, 
There he is. And Wilhelm Dieltai attempts to outline the strengths and frailties of the academic system of his day by juxtaposing the exact sciences and the humanities, the branches that are concerned respectively with the nature of things and the meaning of things. The danger is, of course, that we overemphasize the differences between those two and neglect what they have in common. In a 2010 reflection on Snow's The Two Cultures, Honora O'Neill argued that the two, for all their differences, do share a common ground. Both follow the rules of scholar, scholarly academic research, and as such, both share common assumptions about the need for procedural integrity in the pursuit of what Matthew Arnold called the best that is known and thought in the world, and which I would propose to rephrase as testable and reliable knowledge. O'Neill identifies the common ground between the two academic cultures as a set of standards, and these concern issues such as which methods to use in order to test our methods, how to subject our working assumptions to critical self-questioning, and if necessary, to revise received knowledge in the light of fresh data, new insights, newly emerging questions or concerns. These procedures ensure that knowledge thus pursued becomes reliable and testing. That reliable and testable knowledge we can call knowledge plus. More than just familiarity with the facts or the procedural rules, knowledge plus is capable to reflect upon itself. Knowledge involving the knowledge about that knowledge. And you're you know, putting in a couple of feedback loops to try and create a complex system. The urge to have a critical understanding of our knowledge, to have both the nature of knowledge and the meaning of knowledge involved in our knowledge itself, that is what links the various branches of academic scholarship together and distinguishes them from non-academic pursuits of skill, knowledge, insight, or wisdom, or cultural creativity. To be sure, there are points of contact and even overlap, and, and Carol was very eloquent in, in emphasizing that, and rightly so. Scholarship cannot progress unless researchers have flashes of insights and creativity which can sometimes be intense enough to give you goose pimples. But the core business of the university is not to generate goose pimples. Scholars also need oxygen and a 26-letter alphabet. Their work depends on it. But what your work depends on is not the same as what it aims at. So what is the core business of the university? The answer would at first sight seem a truism. Universities are dedicated to the transgenerational dissemination and development of testable, reliable knowledge. Jacob Grimm, one of the architects together with Humboldt of the modern uh, scholarly system, the university system, aptly outlined a three-tier approach in which the university was an interface between the school and the academy. Schools were dedicated purely to teaching, academies purely to research. The university merged the two in the famous German phrase of Lehre und Forschung, teaching come research. That's what I hear render as dissemination and development um, of reliable and testable knowledge. In order to serve that aim, the university was constructed in, in typical romantic 19th century terms, uh, a historicist on the template of a medieval guild, with a sliding scale in the relationship between students and masters. As students matured, they would be increasingly inducted into the master's research environment until they were ready to take over. All this being reflected in the successive grades, the gradus ad parnassum, the ladder up the Parnassus, of bachelor, master, doctor, professor. In that process, the substance of the teacher-student collaboration would shift from skills and command of the facts towards more general meta-questions and aptitude to conduct research at increasingly challenging levels. Finally, students would become proficient themselves at developing and disseminating testable and reliable knowledge. All this was implied in the teaching come research model. Now, this is still alive and kicking, most of all in the PhD trajectories. But in recent decades, the integrated model has become increasingly lopsided and diffracted. Teaching come research, the hyphen, has increasingly become teaching slash research. The continuum is now conceived as a binary system of two pursuits, interrelated to be sure, but at opposing ends of a weighing scales, subject to different regimes of organization and valorization. This may be a very rarefied point to make, but in actual practice, the shift from teaching come research to teaching slash research has had far-reaching consequences, and we still need to ponder their implications. 
Modern universities, as part of the state's educational system, have come to serve as an increasing portion of the population at large. They're less elitist than they used to be, and are financed and measured principally in terms of educational efficiency. Efficiency meaning having a maximum number of students enroll, incurring a minimum amount of student dropout between enrollment and graduation, and avoiding delays, i.e. making the costly period between enrollment and graduation as brief as possible. It's a type of efficiency that reminds me of abattoirs, really. But that's, uh, um, quality control uh, in this throughput system is primarily seen in the entrepreneurial terms of customer satisfaction. Fee-paying students are seen as customers and the tuition and degree they receive as the product they are entitled to. Bad service will be punished by the invisible hand of the education market. Students will take their custom elsewhere. Enrollments will drop. In this model, research is only a secondary consideration. The value of research lies mainly in the fact that successful research bestows prestige on the university, thereby making it more attractive for incoming customers slash students. Accordingly, the research that faculty can pursue is increasingly entrusted to outside funding, so, um, subject to a researcher's success in pitching project proposals to third parties and taking out of the university's prioritized core business. In fact, the success of a researcher is now measured by the extent to which he or she can buy into this outsourcing and attract outside funding. Two points need to be made. The first is that the university system is deprioritizing precisely those key concepts that are the title of this conference. Creativity, research, innovation. They're all fair and good to proclaim these ideals, but such pieties ring hollow if the university won't put its money, its own money, where its mouth is. The other point is that increasingly the value of research lies in the idea that research is good for the university's standing and market appeal. Universities need creative research. Everybody will say nod and say sure, of course, how else could it be, without realizing that the idea itself is a perversity, a 180 degree twisting of the truth. Research is not there for the sake of the university, but the university historically and fundamentally is there for the sake of research. Universities should realize that the research they cherish and showcase as the main defining characteristic of what makes them special is to an increasing degree being outsourced funded by outside resources, state funding agencies, large companies. And this outside funding is applied principally to liberate researchers from the working conditions with the which the university has seen fit to impose on its staff in order to ensure their flexibility and efficiency. The shift from teaching come research to teaching slash research also means that top researchers are often siphoned away from the teaching end of the discipline. Students may be attracted to enroll for a certain program because of the fame of a given professor, but very often they will find that they are taught by adjunct staff hired on temporary contracts from the professor's research funds so as to replace him or her for intramural teaching duties. This is not to say that researchers nowadays have no benefit at all from working in a university environment. The most important of these benefits is the engagement with the students and the proximities of their colleagues. In fact, students, and I'm picking up again on something Carol was saying, are usually cherished almost in a parental generational way for reminding us of the way we were ourselves and for being potential colleagues in Statu Nashandi. This collegiality with like-minded peer group academics, often informal, maintained by exchanges near the coffee machine or the photocopier, is and remains the most important seedbed of creativity and innovation within the university environment. Faculty staff are more than mere civil servants or employees. They are professionals. And they have chosen their profession as the result of a calling arduously pursued over long years of dedication. The fact that they share that calling is what makes them, in the Roman sense of the word, colleagues. Now, I don't want to be overly you know, doe-eyed about this. Uh, the, colleague, the, the, the colleague is the worst curse for the professor. You know, a professor would be happy if it weren't for the colleagues. And uh, if Patricia Myers-Pax has pointed out that the intensity of community feeling is measured by the degree of gossip 
then faculties are you know, tighter communities in order collegiality than a small village in, in you know, Midland Ireland. Uh, so collegiality cuts both ways, but still, uh, it's there, it's a fact to be reckoned with, but it's informal, and for that reason, it's very difficult to take on board uh, in, the, in, in the planning of things. Collegiality, however, is a profoundly meaningful thing in the working lives of academics. For the university, it constitutes a human resource that deserves to be given its due weight. Now, what happened to bring us to this state of affairs in the half century since Snow's The Two Cultures? The pattern can perhaps best be understood by looking at the most exposed and declining part of the university, a faculty to which Matthew Arnold and I both belong, the humanities. Snow's vindication of the sciences against the humanities was written from his position of an underdog. The sciences were the unappreciated, underrated part of academia, patronized and disregarded by smug literary critics and cultural pundits, puffing their pipes in elbow-patched tweed jackets. That smugness surely existed, and Snow was justified in his attacks, overstated though they were. But in the 50 years since, the tables have well and truly turned. Enrollment in the humanities progress have, have plummeted, job prospects for humanities graduates are dismal, the public stature of the academic critic or historian has evaporated, disciplines and departments are being closed down at an accelerating speed. The humanities have lost economic capital, social capital, symbolic capital. The causes driving this process are linked to the development of a second modernity or liquid modernity, which has also given us the idea of a risk society. Like the rise of romanticism or a grid failure, such a cascading event in a complex system has multiple causes, and this, their multiplicity contains a valuable lesson for us. So allow me a few more minutes of gloom and doom. The shift since snow. To begin with, one has to acknowledge, and acknowledge gratefully, the massive achievements of the empirical sciences since C.P. Snow's day. Our living standards compared to the 1950s have improved almost unrecognizably. Technological progress has been overwhelmingly huge and has affected all spheres of life. The scientists have delivered and they have earned all the kudos they are getting. And of course, the humanities deserve credit too. They too have done their bit for delivering their share in human progress. In the mental and social emancipation of all marginalized groups in society, the critical theorizing and informed reflection of cultural scholars and legal philosophers has been indispensable. However, much of this contribution to human well-being was of a critical rather than a positive nature. By that I mean that academically trained thinkers like Simone de Beauvoir, Franz Fanon, Hannah Arendt or Edward Said contributed their most valuable insights by being critical of what until then had been received wisdom about the nature of women or race identity, of evil or the relation between power and culture. They debunked. Scientists, for their part, came up with new insights because they added positive rather than critical knowledge. They came up with transistors, lasers, in vitro fertilization, and organ transplants. We may perhaps compare the two by saying that the humanities debunked while the sciences discovered. Both are valuable, both are necessary. But on the whole, debunking, necessary though it is, is not as sexy as discovery. You don't get television channels named the deconstruction channel. And there are no Nobel prizes for history writing or musicology. Society's very notion of what scholarly research means has become tightly linked to the idea of discovery, and that leaves the humanities in this century in the cold. It also means that the business of cognitive reflection, understanding our knowledge, which is essential to the growth of knowledge plus, has been losing favor in a hard-nosed factualist climate. We now are increasingly confronted with that condition that Dylan Thomas was talking about when he deplored his useful Christmas presents, those books that told me everything about the wasps, except why. Same goes for Higgs boson particles. <laughs> <laughs> Humanities have themselves to blame also because the language in which they have couched their critical inquiries has become increasingly hermetic and useless to non-academics. The lucidity of Simone de Beauvoir, Franz Fanon, Hannah Arendt, Edward Said has given way to the incomprehensible verbal posturing of their post-structuralist successors, who lose in their social outreach the authority that they might gain within their own professional coteries. And the figure of the cultural pundit as such is a thing of the past. Popular culture has shaken off the precepts of an academically trained elite. Given the rise of the new media, the internet, 
multi-channel commercially financed television, popular culture has become anti-elitist. There is little room for cultural authority in a world of blogs and tweets. In the weltering circulation of crowdsourced opinion making, Knowledge Plus is being challenged by something altogether different, Attitude 2.0. Few or none of the ch uh, change, uh, uh, changes outlined by me were the deliberate policy of a limited number of decision makers, guys in smoky back rooms. They were rather an inevitable response to massive overriding complex transitions. Indeed, the scholars who denounce and bewail these changes, like me, have themselves all served as deans or rectors or committee members in these transitions. This is not a simple binary, they did that to us system. Finger pointing and hand wringing are no good. Now the, the final minutes, uh, like a Dickens novel, you know, you've gone through you know, terrible times of hard, hardship and then you get the, the feel-good moral at the, in the last page. You will realize by now that I'm not very good as a motivational speaker, but still, I, <laughs> um, I do believe that, you know, uh, in our modern world, the need for knowledge plus is unaffected by all of this. And this is not only the worst of times, but it's still a very, very good time. Knowledge Plus is a complex system capable of self-regeneration, and it's needed as much as it was at, as, at the time of Matthew Arnold, when first modernity arrived, rigid modernity, when Mar Matthew Arnold defined a program of sweetness and light against the dour Victorian pragmatism of paleoliberalism. The need will look after itself. This need is older than the universities. Indeed, it's the tradition of reflected knowledge that created the universities in the first place, not the other way around. Even if the entire Jurassic University system were to collapse in the way European monasticism is currently in the process of collapsing, and the scenario is not wholly unthinkable, academic learning would find other frameworks in which to survive. The spirit is flourishing even now exploring thrilling new perspectives and vistas. I have been applying, you know, the, the system theory of Nicholas Luhmann, I've been surreptitiously quoting Ulrich Beck, Pierre Bourdieu, and it's from the middle ground between the two cultures, such as the social sciences and semantic logic and game theory, that valuable impulses are emanating, which are picked up in both branches. Studies of multiple causes and multiple comp contributing causes in the spread of obesity, social, psychological, somatic, geographic, genetic, can be mapped into something that resembles a fluid London underground. And so can the spread of um, nationalism in the 19th century, or the plot of the uh, Count of Monte Cristo, or the distribution of citation communities in the academic system. And we now have ways of mapping and understanding this. Intellectually, the thrill is not gone. People sharing the thrill of understanding their knowledge are the collegial core of what we can call a discipline. Frequently, the discipline will involve intellectuals working on different data sets with different methods. The disciplines of women's studies or European studies can combine sociologists, literary critics, art historians, and linguists, all united around a common concern, a common coffee machine, and a common photocopier. It is crucial to realize that every discipline, every organized body of intellectuals in the pursuit of Knowledge Plus is held together by collegiality and coffee machines and unites different specialisms. Academics should proudly cherish the special skill that is generated by their common collegial pursuit of Knowledge Plus. The ability to focus our minds and at the same time to think outside the box. And again, I'm thinking of what Carol Becker said. To set off the things we know against the things we don't know and things that could be different. We deliver that and this is what the world needs. I'm deeply convinced that the world needs people who can imagine the world differently, who can project themselves into different points of view different meanings of WASPs, other people's mindsets, who can see the world in Dorothy Noyes' fine phrase as a subjunctive space. The world needs that, and universities need that. That's my final statement to you. We can and must see our own workplace in the subjunctive, and imagine the university as an employer, as a framework, differently. If the university wants to foster creativity and innovation, it must itself, as an institution and as an employer, move into a liquid second modernity. Grasp the trapeze that Matthew Arnold was swinging on. Abandon its present refuge in the stultifying comfort zone of predictability, manageability, and deliverables. Universities 
in the past decades of reorganizations and transitions have enjoined upon their staff the need for flexibility and the readiness to engage positively with the necessity for change, and rightly so. But that need cuts both ways. I would like to see the university itself become, as an organization, less managerially introspective, less efficiency and excellence fixated, less predictable, more liquid, more creative, more innovative, and above all, more collegial. Thank you very much.